Yes, you're right. There is a new Smyrna beach in Florida. Smyrna. Yes, we do have that. It's called, um, no, it's right south of Daytona uh, Beach, but it's north of Melbourne, New Smyrna. I thought that was, I just rem remember that yesterday as I was getting all excited about the Ecclesia at Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to pick up there where I left off. I don't really want to do an exhaustive thing on the Ecclesias here because I did it already in the bunker days. If you want uh, exhaustive details on these churches, these Ecclesias of Revelation 2 and 3, um, you can go back to the bunker days. And again, why am I talking about this? Because I believe, along with, with Dr. Bollinger and A.E. Nock, these men are smart enough to agree with me. Uh, that these ecclesias are future and it's preparing a people to go through the tribulation. They're set in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Oh, speaking of modern day Turkey, you're not going to believe this. Are you ready for this? Yesterday, we got an application here at the bed and breakfast where I live. A kid wants to come here for a year. Now, I don't know if Juliana's going to accept his application. Sounds like a nice guy. Guess where he's from? But up, but up, Turkey. He's from Turkey. Can you, can you imagine that? So I may be able to give you some turkey scoops when this kid moves here. If he does, I don't know. He's gonna. I'm using the onboard camera again today. I like the grain and the weird lighting. Um, I was telling you about Stacy, uh, the woman at the conference. I wanted to give you a few more details because this is encouraging. This is good for you to know. I said Stacy was the conference organizer. I showed you a picture of her. No, that was Andy May. Andy May is the conference organizer. Stacy is the one who owned the center where we met. It was a center for teens. She works with teens. She has a great love for people. Absolutely had heard nothing of this truth before before this conference. When Andy and her made this business deal to rent the center, she wanted to know who was coming in here, so she did research. She researched me specifically because she thought, oh, what, some kind of cult is coming in here? Who is Martin Zender, some sort of cult leader? So she researched me. And um, yeah, you'll find some negative things about me because people lie people when you're set up and you are a public figure and you're talking about the truth you will be lied about and you will be blacklisted by certain christian organizations so but overwhelming majority of things about me and my work on the internet are positive and great so she was impressed by that she looked at some of my books and andy of course gave her my books and she started to read them but this is my main point to you is that she was impressed by us she kept saying again and again i really like you people this is why paul said it was so important to be a living letter to have the word of god dwelling in you means that you display the fruit of the spirit you can't force this fruit to grow, but this fruit will naturally grow when the Spirit of God is inside of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. And of course, I embody all these things. I try. Of course, I don't. Uh, but to the degree that God makes it grow in me, I am happy and satisfied. And I do see it in me. And I know you see it in all of you. And so we were together together. And she had, we were a good reflection on the truth that we were teaching. We were polite, we were kind, we were patient when things went wrong, and things did go wrong. As I told you, I walked into the conference Saturday morning, and things weren't ready. And so I was a little stressed because the conference was beginning in 15 minutes. Did I tell you this? I can't remember. There was no coffee, there was, the tables were not right, and, and I had given specific instructions. I'm a nice guy, but look, here's what I need. Boom, 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 boom. And that's what I expect. Boom, 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 boom. So when it's not there, I took a deep breath. I am not difficult to work with. I'm easy. Some people think I'm a control freak. I am not. I do sweat the details. Anyway, I said, Stacy, this, 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 this. And she said, I'll get right on it. I'll get right on it. I said, thank you. It was calm. You see? It was 
a problem, but it was worked through. All weekend, she was in contact with people like me who have the Spirit of God in them and have spiritual fruit that shows on the surface. This is why it's so important, Paul says, to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called. Okay? And patience is tough, I'm telling you. That's one of the things that probably many of us struggle with the most. And uh, peace, yeah, peace also. The opposite of peace probably would be anger. We all get fired up, we get angry. And there is righteous indignation. There's a place for anger. But Paul says, don't let the sun set on your anger. See, we're not in this totally just to get head knowledge, to understand about God. We do. We do want to do that. But we also want to live the truth. And I exhort you to live the truth. And it affected Stacy. And it put a good light on our message. And she saw how I was giving away books. And she saw how I myself bought the Maker's Mark whiskey for the congregation. And the congregants did drink together, partaking of the whiskey of the Lord. Yes, the Lord made the whiskey. The grain beverage, the grains are distilled. Did you know that whiskey is basically distilled beer? They take it past the fermentation process. Um, they fermented a grain is called beer, and they take beer basically and distill it. They turn it into a spirit. All the sugar is removed from it. I don't know the process, but it's a natural process. It's a God-given process. And as I'm speaking to you, this is kind of a catch-all show, but I am going to go back to Smyrna and Pergamum's next. I'm going to give you my impressions of these places. I'm just going to go through this real quick. I'm going to tackle things in this that nobody else tackles. Um, and then we're going to look back at Bollinger's words on it, probably. I told you I wasn't going to be exhaustive, and yet here I am going into detail. I'll see what I'm going to do. I'm definitely going to give you the political situation today between Turkey and Israel. And if this young man, I wrote his name down. What's this guy's name? Oh, well, if this young man does come here, I'll have him give me the scoop, the turkey scoop. And I'll give you the turkey scoop for sure. Uh, oh, my sister told me before I tell you about the whiskey, my sister sent me a text while I was at the conference, I think it was, that the hurricanes in the Atlantic in September were the most on record ever. September 2017, this was from the Weather Channel. September 2017 was the most active month on record for Atlantic hurricanes. I'm just saying. They're all out to get me and Waylon. The hurricanes are out to get me and Waylon. But we're going to put sand under our doors. And we're going to batten down our hatches. And if it's bad enough, we're going to get the heck out of Dodge. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. This is funny. So, whiskey is distilled beer. What I was going to do at the conference, and I totally forgot to do that, I had it in my mind, and I was so hassled by the details of the conference, wearing many hats at the conference that I forgot. I was going to say, after I introduced the fact that this would be the Maker's Mark conference, I was going to say, it's not all about whiskey, of course. It's about the fellowship. Whiskey is just a little added uh, delight given us by God to make our hearts uh, glad. And then I was going to begin um, the conference, and now my... I'm going to speak to you on the health benefits of whiskey. <laughs> it was going to be a joke, you know. But there actually are. You go to the website. It's like 21 health benefits of whiskey. Of course, it must be drinking in. It must be drunk in moderation. Not drunk's a bad word to use there. It must be drank. Drunken. Another bad term. Not sure. Look it up yourself. Now, concerning... Smyrna. The next sentence I was going to tell you yesterday is the disturbing one, but in a way it's very specific and it has a degree of comfort sewn into it. Fear nothing, Christ says to the ecclesia at Smyrna. Fear nothing that you are about to be suffering. Lo, the adversary is about to be casting some of you into jail that you may be tried and you will be having affliction 10 days. So jail would suck. There's going to be apparently still persecution of these ecclesias. The whole world is going to hate Israel. We know that. We know that 
the Battle of Armageddon is a battle in which, it's a battle that's never fought, God preempts it, but it's a battle in which the nations surround Israel to destroy her. So there is anti-Semitism no matter where you go, no matter what age you are in. And um, it really wasn't in full swing back in the first century. They hated Christians specifically, but they didn't really hate Jews, I don't think. I think that the anti-Semitism came later. I mean, we know the Jews killed Jesus Christ, and so um, there's a resentment there. And I think that it wasn't... I mean, somebody tell me if I'm wrong here. I don't think this anger against Jews started until after, long after the Jews crucified Christ. And it came from Christians. No, I can't say that either because... Look at the Muslims. Everybody hates Jews, not just Christians. What is it? Is it they don't like that they have wealth? They don't like that they're good managers of money? They don't like that they have a natural, God-given hunger for power and use it? What is it? But we see it happening here that Satan is about to be casting some of you into jail. Again, how does Satan do it? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Satan uses flesh and blood to enact his will. Except in the case of our Lord, Satan tempted him directly, directly. But how did Satan kill Christ? Well, that was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He killed, tried to kill Christ through Judas. He inhabited Judas. He used his people. He obsessed his people. And so this is going to be happening in the days when Israel's trying to get a foothold, get their self together in Turkey. It's going to be, there's going to be great persecution. Adversary is about to be casting some of you into jail that you may be tried, and you will be having affliction 10 days. That's not so bad. Affliction's bad. 10 days, there's a limit to it. There's always a limit. God's judgments, God's disciplines. And I just told someone this on the phone yesterday. This person said, why am I going through all these things? And I said, it's the discipline of God. God disciplines those he loves. If you're not disciplined, then you're not sons. I know this comes from Hebrews chapter 12. It's a circumcision letter. It is still written by Paul. It's not to us, but we can learn from it because that is a transadministrational truth that trial perfects you. Yes, and discipline perfects you. God brings it to you as to sons. He loves you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't mess with you. And he's messing with you. But it's not messing with. These are surgical strikes. Ten days. Surgical strikes. The locust for five months. Surgical strikes. The hailstones have a certain weight. And they won't weigh any more or any less. Surgical strikes. One third of the earth is afflicted with blood, with fouled waters. One third of humanity is killed. That's a math problem. It's surgical. One third third not two thirds not 1.5 thirds one third take one third of a pie of a piece of pie out of the pie you cut it here and you cut it there and you remove it it's surgical someone gets one third of their liver removed the doctor doesn't take out your whole liver they take out the bad part it's one third it's scientific all these trials you're going through are scientific thus also with the Smyrnians here in Florida, we have the New Smyrnians. In ancient Asia Minor, Minor, it was simply the Smyrnians. Become, become faithful until death. I shall be giving you the wreath of life. Become faithful until death. Hmm. Kind of contradicts the afflicted 10 days thing just a little bit. Until death. Huh. Well, listen. That's good advice for anybody. Be faithful until death or, for our, in our case, uh, until the snatching away. Some of us may die. I've had friends who died in Christ and they remained faithful until death. After death, you can't be faithful because you're dead. You're not experiencing anything. You're not praising the Lord. You're not hungry. You're not tired. You're not anything. You can't be faithful in death. That's why you're faith, be faithful until death. Why isn't Jesus telling them to be faithful after death? Because you're dead. Well, what about when they're resurrected? Then you don't need faith. When you're resurrected, you're standing. Though, oh, this, I think, is proof that Jesus Christ is disguising himself. This is it now. I, after seeing this, thinking about this live with you, this is a live Bible study. I love this. Is that 
be faithful until death. If Jesus Christ is in your midst, you really don't need faith. So if this person walking among them, I maybe don't think they, th they know it's Jesus Christ. He can take many forms, many forms. He can become unrecognized. He could just be a, let's say, an itinerant teacher who shows up in these camps, in these dispersed groupings of people of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they might not even know it's Jesus Christ. But there's going to be teaching. You see, we are not tried above what we are able, number one. I know you may doubt that, but we're not tried above what we are able. But what does God do? According to Paul, God gives us the sequel. King James says, God will not try you above what is you are able. But with the trial, I'll say it in King James Version. God will not try you above what you are able. But with the trial, he will provide a way of escape for you to undergo it. How? That wasn't a King James accent, sorry. How are you undergoing something at the same time God's provided a way of escape. That verse is a contradiction in the King James Version. Well, why not? The King James Version contradicts, its, contradicts itself many times. The contradiction here is due to a translation issue. God will not provide a way of escape. The concordant, for whatever Greek phraseology is there, concordant has God will provide the sequel I know what the English elements are of that Greek word. I don't know the Greek word right now, but the English elements are outstepping, outstepping. He will provide you. He will let you see where you're coming. See, look, you will be afflicted 10 days. Maybe that affliction ends in death, but there is an outstepping. After 10 days, you know, there's going to be some kind of relief, either death or something. But for us, an outstepping is the concordant translates its sequel, shows you the end. Like he shows you the sequel. When Stephen was being stoned to death, he saw the sequel. He saw Christ glorified above. He saw Christ sitting on his throne or standing next to his throne or something. He had a vision. He was looking at That's why he was so calm and praying for the people killing him. How can anybody do that while large rocks are being thrown at them? It's because they have the sequel. They can die in peace. They can die in confidence. Jesus Christ said, Father, unto your hands I commit my spirit. He had a sequel. He had the outstepping. He saw ahead of time how it was going to end. And he knew his father was faithful. And he knew what would be his uh, allotment, his appointment, once he raised from the dead. This is great advice for us. I can't believe I'm doing a Christian thing here. I can't believe what's happening. I'm basically taking the teaching given to these Jewish ecclesia and I'm up you might kind of yeah am I yeah I kind of am I'm applying it to us but see I'm not saying that's the interpretation of it I'm not interpreting saying this is for the body of Christ I'm just taking things I'm getting from reading this and saying part of this truth here can be applied trans administrationally that is not only for the circumcision evangel, but to the uncircumcision evangel. It can be applied transadministrationally to our walk and our lives. It's a principle that God in his wrath remembers mercy. It's a principle that God does not try you above what you are able. I got this from 10 days. You will be afflicted 10 days. And I remind you that the tribulation period, the whole of it, is seven years. But God in his mercy cuts it in half. Another math problem. What's seven divided by two? 3.5. And 3.5 years are the worst of it. Even with that, the locusts only afflict for five months. This also presents a problem for these crazy people. I'm sorry for calling them that who want to spiritualize the entire book of Revelation. What's the spiritual meaning of five months? What's the spiritual meaning of 10 days? What's the spiritual meaning of 1,260 days? What's the spiritual meaning? How do you interpret five days? How do you interpret 10 days? How do you interpret five months? I don't interpret it. I believe it. It's not to be interpreted. It's to be believed. Become faithful until death. Well, you know, that doesn't necessarily follow that death has to follow. 
I mean, we can be told, be faithful until death. Okay, I will be faithful until unto death, but it doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to die. It just means, this is my advice to you, be faithful unto death. Does that mean I'm going to die? Not necessarily. It just means that's what you're willing to do. God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Takes him up to what, Mount Moriah, was it? Brings out the knife. Yeah, Abraham's faithful unto death. In this case, the death of his son. Here comes a messenger of the Lord. Stays his hand. Isaac is saved. Abraham was faithful unto death, but he was delivered out of that death. Not by going into it and then getting out of it, but by being willing to do it. And then God says, okay, cut. That's a print. Yeah, that was a good time for the director to yell, cut. Right before it's like, cut. All right, I got that scene. Put it in the book. Put it on the screen. Lock it down. Print it. Yeah, that's what happened. And so, it's the willingness. Same thing with Solomon, as I'm thinking about it. Solomon, I'll give you everything you want, Solomon. Whatever you want, Solomon, ask me and you shall have it. Solomon's thinking about that. Stroking his beard. Thinking, ah, wives, concubines, the best wine in the land, riches, Many chariots, many horses, a fine palace. Hmm. But you know what? I don't need any of that. What I really need is wisdom. I'm going to take the higher ground and I want wisdom. God, give me wisdom. Don't you have any other wishes? No, I just want wisdom. So God was impressed by that. We're speaking relatively as God condescends to discourse with human beings. And so... He gave Solomon everything else that his heart desired. It's the willingness, you see, to give it all up. It's the willingness to be faithful unto death. You are willing. I know you. I know you. My friends, fellow members of the body of Christ, you will be loyal and faithful to this calling unto death. But I say you're not going to have to die. I say you and I are going to remain you and I are going to survive to the coming of the Lord. That's what I say. And I still say it could be two and a half minutes from now, even though I could be mistaken about that. I would like it to be two and a half minutes from now. But if it's not, then I am going on to Christ. I am going to continue to run this race with the through mentality unto death faithful unto death if need be none of us want to die it could happen any day not by natural causes but by the danger that lurks behind every corner and behind every tree behind every telephone pole behind every person almost in this world dangerous place to be this world but we have christ and we're extracting truth from every corner of the scriptures that we can. Not illicitly, not illegally, but I think using the spirit of discernment in us. I will continue to speak on these ecclesias as God gives me the wisdom. I pray for wisdom, you pray for wisdom. We always pray for discernment and God is giving us the desires of our hearts. I use desire they're not as nouns, as things, but as a verb. He's giving us the desires. He's putting in us the right desires so that our will will ideally be conformed to his.